Chapter 19, Chapter 17, The Yuparupa Hunt Chapter 17, The Yuparupa Hunt Let's see how you like an early winter, asshole. Ryu yelled, transforming into the ice whelp. Inhaling, he spat a cloudy mass of freezing gas at their enemy, a gigantic blue vegetative head the size of a cart, covered in wart-like growths and dangling roots. Disturbingly, it had a massive, ugly humanoid face, with shining green eyes that leered down at them as it hovered in the air. Watching the freezing magic cover it, Ryu reverted to his normal form and crouched down, he was tired, but it wasn't the bone-deep need to stop moving he had felt when he first started transforming. Ha! Huh. How's that? Crunchy style! The head retorted, both its own mouth and the growth on top of it spoke in unison, deep bass and beautiful singsong echoing eerily together. Said growth was a pretty human girl with ivy for hair, wooden skin, and a dress of white flower petals, it was the beast's lure to attract prey into the glade in the back of the Owlwoods. Floating forward, it suddenly rammed Ryu, crushing him to the ground before retreating over the massive crater it had emerged from. Yay! I like you! Pain, he grunted, prying himself off the floor slowly, despite multiple broken bones. Little help here. Bit busy. Rand grunted, casting healing magic over Nina and Kat as all three of them took a lightning spell from one of the beast's two sprouts, identical lures that floated separately, roots dangling from beneath their dresses. Get you in a second. I got it. Bao called, healing Ryu's wounds. There you go, buddy. And now. Sighting carefully, he watched Sten and Jean stalk the other sprout until he had the right angle, and fired a bolt straight into its eye. The decoy went down, and as it did, Sten and Jean tore through it with knives and rapier, finishing the job. Right, that's one down. Suaki! The monster shouted, its lower mouth glowing with the same green light that filled its eyes. Come here, darling, Mama Algernon will help you. Turning away from them, it levitated the dead sprout up to its lure, and the girl atop the beast embraced the corpse before pressing their lips together, prompting a haze of green magical energy to cover the sprout, as its wounds began to heal. Are they? Sten stammered. Is it doing what I... Who cares? Ryu growled, shaking his head to clear his own distraction. Nail the big one while it's distracted. This one's down, too. Cat growled, ramming the end of her battle staff through the other sprout's chest as she stood on it, fall into the ground. Pulling it back out, she jumped into the air towards the main enemy. Come on, asshole, no more hiding behind your kids. Danielle! Algernon shrieked and roared in unison. It's okay, baby, I've got you. Releasing the fully revived Suaki, it called the other sprout to it as well. Now! Nina called out. Magic, while they're all together! As she spoke, she called up a pyramid of flames, enveloping all three. A moment later, Jean, Sten and Rand all responded in kind, as Rand lashed the three enemies with electricity of his own, Jean threw huge rocks of ice that slammed home into the giant plant, and Sten nailed it with a detonation of air pressure. The beast buckled, roaring, and both sprouts went down a second time in flames. How dare you! The monstrosity and its lure both raged. I'll show you the winds of winter! The vegetative face's mouth gaped, and it spewed cold breath over the four of them as it spun around. They buckled, but the other three were charging in, Cat actually leaping into the air high enough to land on top of it, behind the lure. Before it could respond, she had rammed her staff straight through the top of the lure's head, with no bones, it was completely skewered. At the same time, Ryu aimed at the point on the underside most cratered by the magic, carving into it with both arms. Chunks of plant matter flew as he kept on hacking and slashing, and a glowing green core was soon exposed. As soon as it was visible, he ducked out of the way, and a moment later a bolt flew straight and true, puncturing the core. One direct shot was all it took, the glowing green liquid inside spilled out, nearly dousing Ryu. Fortunately, he got out of the way in time, it smelled vile. Don't! The face bellowed haltingly as it grew limp. Don't! Take me too! Lightly! Ah! Uh. I don't! Feel! So. Good. Moaning, it crashed into the ground and died, collapsing into a heap of foul-smelling plant matter as the magical energy filling its core bled out. Within moments, it was nothing more than a brown, decayed pile of compost. What the hell was that all about? Sten asked after a moment. The others shrugged. I'm starting to feel like being a dragon isn't as impressive as it used to be, Ryu growled irritably as Rand and Bao healed them all. Kawadara was one thing, but this freak. 
sure, it worked, but she didn't even notice. Aren't there supposed to be multiple levels of dragon transformation? Nina pointed out. When you had that incident with Sana, you turned into an adult dragon, not a whelp. That should be the second level. You look like you're ready for it, too, turning back isn't hitting you as hard as it used to. Yeah, but how's he gonna learn to do that? Bao pointed out. You need to learn it from somebody, right? And there ain't exactly anybody left to teach that. Don't think just trying to fuse with Sana again would be a good idea. No, 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 Ryu agreed. Let's just go, people. I'll figure something out. Right now, we have definitely earned that owl fruit. Demonstrate, Kat grumbled. It is way too early for this shit. They had woken up shortly after dawn, and after a quick breakfast, headed out back to the owl woods in search of the fruit, Bob had slept in, to nobody's surprise or care. Once they had entered the woods, however, they had heard a girl singing beautifully. Following the music had brought them to a clearing with multiple strange plants, like giant lantern flowers, growing in the back. The girl had been standing before the plants, and when they had accosted her, she had revealed her true form before calling up her sprouts and attacking them. Ah, this must be the owl fruit, yes? Jean asked, pulling a golden fruit from the bloom at the end of one plant. It was the size of an apple and shaped like a snowman, two connected spheres of dissimilar size, a soft golden color. Bao, Kat, Rand, and Stan pulled four more from the others, they seemed firm, but not tough, and looked ripe and juicy. They seem to be quite a delectable treat, indeed. It is no wonder that the Yuparupa are willing to cross the countryside every year just to sample them, yes. They do look pretty good, Kat agreed, staring at hers. You know. It's not like these critters won't go for them if there's just a little missing, right? Like. Just one bite, just to see what they taste like. That'll be fine, won't it? We had better not, Nina told her, shaking her head. We don't know just how much fruit we'll need before we're done. Five pieces isn't exactly an overstock. If we catch the Yuparupa and we still have some left, then we can try it. But it won't still be totally ripe by then. Kat protested. Business before pleasure. A w it won't take us that long, with any luck, Ryu pointed out as they started walking back towards the lodge, keeping well away from the reeking heap of compost. Which is for the best, since we're on a bit of a time limit. Jean can warp us neat the coast of Tantar, and we can start looking for seaside caverns right away today. He made a face. As soon as our guest pries his carcass out of bed, anyways. Are you sure we can't just leave him here? Rand muttered. It's tempting, Ryu admitted. But we probably shouldn't. That story about needing the hold spell was bullshit, Tusk sent him along to keep an eye on us. I don't think he's a demon himself, but he's probably in on the conspiracy. I don't really know what game those two are playing, but Five Zenny says he can contact Tusk at any time if we look like we're skipping out on the deal. And if he does, Tusk will seize the moment and kill the grass man early, Sten realized, narrowing his eyes. I get it now. You're right, boss. We're going to have to play along if we want to save that poor sap. How do we get into these messes? Rand groaned, rubbing the tiny shell plate atop his head. Nobody really had an answer for him. It ended up being several more hours before Bob awakened, which the group spent waiting impatiently. To pass the time, Ryu and Kat sparred, while Rand and Bao discussed more advanced white magic spells. Nina did the same with Sten, the Highlander didn't use magic much, but he had a natural affinity for fire and air, one the Windian princess seemed intent on pushing to its full potential. Jean, on the other hand, produced a pad of paper and a pencil and began sketching the others, nobody was really sure how to feel about that, but they didn't complain. When Bob did pry himself out of his room shortly before noon, falling for ale and meat, he insisted on gorging himself before they left, increasing the group's irritability. Once he was done, Jean warped them to Tentar, and they began combing the coast for caves, according to Nina, Yuparupa only lived in ones deep enough that no trace of sunlight shone through. Unfortunately, all the caves they found were too shallow, and several days passed fruitlessly. They kept double watch at night, one man watching for monsters while the other kept his or her eyes on Bob, who slept slightly apart from them. There's another cave, Sten pointed out as they walked south along the beach on the fifth day of searching. Think this'll be the one? It was a clean-looking opening out of the side of a small cliff up ahead, the bottom three feet of it underwater. Fortunately, it was still early enough in autumn that the day was warm, and they were all used to treading water by then. They must be here somewhere, yes. 
Jean told him cheerfully, even with their unpleasant companion, the Creeper Prince could never stay in a bad mood for long. Eventually, our luck will strike gold. Come, let us hope this will be the one. Breaking into a jog, he raced ahead of them towards the cave, waving his rapier and actually hooping as he entered the water. Everybody else exchanged a long look, even Bob. What the heck does his optimism run on, anyways? Bao asked. It can't be natural. Perhaps it's a blessing from Saint Eva, Nina said with a straight face. Ugh. Come on, let's get after him, Ryu told them, shaking his head. If there is a Nyapurupa in there and he tries taking it on all by himself, it probably won't be pretty. Even Jean wouldn't be that stupid, would he? Rand asked. Everybody thought about that for a moment, then took off as fast as they could run, or fly, in Nina's case, towards the cave. End guard! Jean was shouting as they neared it. Ahaha, not bad, but here. And here, and here. Oh ho, watch yourself. Looking inside, they saw that he was engaged in what appeared to be a fencing duel with a floating, bloated fish. Light blue with comically tiny fins, so obese that it was nearly spherical, it would have been a joke were it not for the single long, thin horn protruding from its forehead. Said horn seemed to actually have an edge to it as well as a point, and Jean was happily exchanging jabs and parries with it. Does this guy do this sort of thing a lot? Bob asked after a long moment. Yeah, more or less. Ryu sighed. Hey, Jean. Need any help? Ah, Monday Yush. Jean yelped as the fish pierced his shoulder, and fell back on his rear. Pulling back, the fish took aim again, this time to kill. That'd be a yes. Sten growled, throwing one of his numerous knives. It only slightly penetrated the fish's thick, leathery hide, but it attracted its attention away from Jean. Turning, it charged them, and Ryu cut it out of the air. His saber was heavy enough to slice through, and it expired, deflating like a balloon once it was punctured. Somebody heal Jean, he grumbled, sheathing the sword again. You okay, man? A moment's diversion, nothing more, Jean assured him as Bao healed the wound. Not that I am ungrateful for your assistance, of course, mon amis. Standing back up, he pointed his rapier into the cave, it stretched off into the darkness, the water still filling it. Shall we proceed, then? I have a good feeling about this one, yes. Let's hope so, Kat grumbled, the ocean came almost up to her chest. Fighting in water ain't exactly my favorite thing in the world. I just hope the ceiling doesn't get any lower, Nina murmured, conjuring up a glowing sphere of magical light for them to see by. There's a side cave over there, Sten pointed out up ahead. I'll go take a look. He waded ahead through the water and peered in, then yelped as a flock of harpies with pink feathers and blue hair swooped out over him. Whoa. Their leader's talons raked him across the arms, and he fell back quickly, driving her away with his knives. Oh, a delivery. She screeched. Look, girls, lunch. She paused as she looked the rest of the group over, and they advanced slowly, Cat and Rand cracking their knuckles. Um. Awful big meal, actually. Not sure if we can eat all this. So let's just put them to sleep. Another one suggested. Then we can eat all we want. She started to inhale deeply, but Bao nailed her between the eyes before she could breathe out, and she plummeted into the water. Sister. The third one shrieked before diving towards Rand. All right, that does it. You're all oh, no. The big farmlander had drawn back his fist to meet her, and his punch smashed her all the way back into the cave they'd emerged from. A moment later, there was a muffled thud from back in the darkness, followed by a splash. Um. The first harpy stammered. Wrong address. Nice try, Kat told her, leaping off Rand's back to smack her out of the air with a downward swing of her staff. Nuts, the harpy moaned as she took the hit on top of her skull and went under. Yeah, I don't think that was it, Bao grumbled, reloading his crossbow. Let's keep going and try the next one. I'll check it, Rand volunteered. A few minutes further into the seaside cave, they saw another side tunnel, and as he had promised, the big man went in, only to yell as a pack of blue, flying imps flew out, yipping and jabbing at him with crude stone spears. He swatted at them ineffectually, until Nina blew them away with a flaming pyramid. Thanks. No problem, she replied. I'd rather not call next, though. I'm not exactly the most durable of us. Oh, like I am. 
Sten muttered, then sputtered as Cat shoved his head under the water. Behave, children! Ran sighed. Come on, let's go! Ryu shook his head. I'll check the next one. Fortunately, that turned out not to be necessary, soon up ahead, the cave floor rose out of the water, and they climbed up onto dry land. Beyond that, it suddenly expanded into a massive chamber, the floor scattered with bones from local wildlife, both normal animals and monsters. Either something very bad is about to happen, or we just struck gold, Bao predicted, as Nina increased the light, revealing a row of low, wide caves in the back wall. A strong, animal musk filled the entire chamber, and as Ryu approached one, he saw a pair of green glimmers reflecting the light in the very back of it. Jackpot, he murmured. We'll have to see one to be sure, but unless I miss my guess, we have our Upat Upas, ladies and gentlemen. They are supposed to be large, but very low and wide, Nina murmured, examining the holes. These seem like the right shape of burrow. Then we have succeeded. Jean crowed. Marvelous. Not quite yet. Sten shook his head. It's not a win until we actually nab the critter, and I don't think we want to go in there after one. No way, Rand agreed. You couldn't fit me in there with a plow. I would find some difficulty in that as well, Jean admitted. And even those of us who could get in there wouldn't be able to fight like that, Cat pointed out, then glanced at Bob. Any ideas? Don't look at me, babe. He raised his hands, smirking. I'm just here to handle the goods once you've got it down. Figures, she growled, ignoring his leer. Well, anybody who's actually smarter than me got a plan. Let's try putting an owl fruit down in front of one, Nina suggested. Then we'll all back off, and jump it once it comes out. Works for me. Ryu rummaged around in his pack and pulled out one of the fruits, wrapped in cloth. Let's give it a shot. The fruit still looked ripe, and its delicious scent overtook the cavern's odor quickly. Oh, man, it has been way too long since breakfast, Cat moaned. We had better have some left over. Bao, Jean, and Stan all nodded in agreement. Then let's do it right the first time, Ryu told them, and they all moved back, away from the fruit. Wait for it. Wait for it. After several minutes, the Uparupa poked its head out, sniffing at the air. It was not a cute animal, though it appeared to be a rodent, its flesh was a leathery greenish-brown, and the only fur aside from a tan ridge down its back were the large pink ear tufts. Its body was broad and flat, as was its head, with a massive jaw that took up most of its face. There were strange, reddish appendages growing from above its eyes that twitched, as did its tail, which was raised to curl above it like a scorpion's despite being thin and ropey. That's an Uparupa, Bao whispered. What the hell's the big deal about that ugly thing? Sten shushed him as the Uparupa crept slowly out of the cave, then suddenly lunged for the owl fruit, snatching it up in its jaws. Now! Ryu yelled, dashing forward. Dogpile! Screeching. The Uparupa backpedaled, but Rand, Cat, and Sten had planned ahead. Grabbing them in his huge hands, the big farmlander pitched them like balls at the rodent's back, and they each landed on a shoulder, grabbing hold. Cat clung on with her unnatural strength, while Sten grappled, long arms and legs reaching around it and pinning the foreleg. The Uparupa bucked like a wild horse, throwing them both off, but they had kept it from escaping long enough for the rest of the group to get there. The fight was vicious, but short, despite the Uparupa's ferocity, it stood no chance against the seven of them once they had it surrounded, even if they had to be careful not to permanently damage it. A few minutes was all it took before Cat managed to break one of its legs, and it fell forward on one side, twitching and squealing. Cool, Ryu said, sheathing his sword, he had had to use the blunt side of it in the fight. Now then, let's... Please. The Uparupa hissed, voice high and nasal. Please don't. Don't. Hurt. You say. Don't hurt. Please. Whoa, whoa, what the hell? Bao yelped, as everybody's eyes widened. It talks. What is this? Not. Well, the Yuparupa continued. Not. Speak your. Speak. Not well. But. Try. Please don't. Please don't. Shit, Ryu said, looking around at the rest of his team. We didn't count on this. This wasn't part of the plan. Why not? Bob asked, walking over. Nice work. 
had me wondering if you guys were for real with all that clowning around earlier on in, but you took this freak down real good. Now all we have to do is haul it back to the circus, and Tusk will give you your flower boy to do whatever the hell you want with. Easy as pie. Shut up, Cat snarled. It's intelligent, you sick shit. It's talking to us. They all must be, in here. She gestured around to the other caverns, more green pairs of eyes were shining out from each, watching them. Big deal, Bob scoffed. Aren't you guys supposed to be pro mercs? Don't tell me you still actually give a crap about morals and shit. Give me a break. You want your plant, you bring the boss back his yuburupa, or your trophy is mulch. All there is to it, and feeling bad about it's just gonna slow you down. You won't even need to worry about the loss, these freaks aren't a recognized clan, after all. So stop whining and let's just haul the stupid thing back already, will you? The sooner I'm out of this shithole and back to the circus, the better. Right, that just about does it for me, Rand decided, glaring down at Bob. Anybody else had more than enough of this crap? The other six all nodded in agreement, and he reached down and grabbed Bob by the head. Cool. What the hell are you doing? Bob squealed, drawing a knife, only for Sten to snatch it from him. Flailing around, he tried to break out of Rand's grasp and failed as the big farm clansman dragged him over to another Yuparupa hole. Hey, stop. Cut it out, damn it. Thoughtcat told you to shut up, Rand said clinically, shifting his grip to Bob's waist and shoving him, head first, into the hole. Ignoring the hireling's kicking and cursing, he continued ramming him in until his feet disappeared into the darkness. A moment later, there was an enraged squeal followed by a scream from Bob and several violent noises, and then the cavern was silent once more. You realize that we're gonna have to go deal with Tusk right away, now, Sten pointed out. Five Zenny says the shithead was reporting into him regularly via magic. If Tusk doesn't get another call soon, he'll kill the grass man. And we still don't have any plan for how we're going to justify killing him. Don't worry, I think I know how to get Tusk to start the fight, Ryu told him before turning back to the Yuburupa, who was still watching them warily as it lay on its side, breathing heavily. Sorry about that, man. We didn't know. Bao, could you? On it, Bao agreed, healing the beast. You. The Yuburupa groaned, slowly standing back up and looking from one of them to another mistrustfully. You no take. You let go. But of course, Mon Ami, Jean explained, bowing. As Monsieur Ryu said, we had no knowledge of your intelligence. Had we been aware, this never would have happened, I assure you. As it stands, all we can do is apologize, and beg for your forgiveness, yes. You silly, the Yuburupa said after a moment. But funny. Like. Wait. Running back into its hole, it re-emerged a moment later, carrying a blade in its mouth, it appeared to be a well-crafted claymore. Dropping it on the ground, it spoke again. Nasty man come, try catch us. He die, leave this. Me take because shiny. Now give you, because nice. No try to catch again. Bye bye. Tail wagging, it vanished into its hole once more. Hey, not bad, Ryu murmured, picking the sword up and testing its balance in one hand carefully. It was about three and a half feet long, with a fairly broad, double-edged blade and a cross hilt. The steel glimmered in an oddly reverberating way when it caught the light as he moved it around. I like it. I should hope so, Sten said, eyes wide. That's Gun's Steel, from the Builder Clan. One of their smiths must have made that sword. Do you have any idea how expensive those things are? Trust me, boss. You'll want to keep that. Demonstrate. Ryu nodded. I'll have to remember to get a sheath made for it as soon as we get the chance. He narrowed his eyes. Right now, though, we've got business to take care of back at the circus. Everybody ready to go slay a demon? He says it like it's just going to get lunch, Kat commented to the others. That settles it. We are getting too used to this. You still haven't explained what this plan of yours is, Bao pointed out. How are we gonna get Tusk to start this? Let me put it this way. Ryu glanced around. Out of all the, the demons we've met so far, what was always the key to getting them to lose their tempers? If I had to pick a single unifying factor, Nina murmured thoughtfully. I'd say it would be when their plans start going wrong. They all construct elaborate plots, and it seems to infuriate them when things don't follow their script. She's got a point, Kat agreed. Hell, I think August actually put it that way. Bitched about his script. Exactly. Ryu glanced at the Yuparupa hole. I think I know what they were going for here. 
If Tusk's a demon, he probably knew already that these guys were sentient. He wanted to force us to bring one in, if we wanted the grass man alive. To screw with us. Make us do something we normally wouldn't. Figured we needed the guy so badly we'd do this, even if we didn't like it, and we'd never forgive ourselves for it. So what happens if we go marching back there right now, and tell him we changed our minds and he can go to hell? Tricky, tricky, Sten said, rubbing his chin. Could go bad on us if he controls his temper after all and tells us to walk we'd be shit out of luck in that case. He smiled coldly. Doubt that'll happen, though. Not a guy like that. If a cold customer like Trout lost it, there's no way a live wire like that will keep his head. I'd say the odds are in our favor. And then we will be able to administer justice with our hands free, yes. Jean smiled brightly. An excellent plan, Mon Amis. Let's do it, then. Ryu nodded. Warp us back, and we'll take care of this before he figures out something's wrong with his stooge. Wait, wait, you're forgetting something, Cat pointed out. The owl fruit, remember? We've still got to try some. Politeness would dictate that we leave it for our hosts, to make up for our unintentional rudeness, Nina suggested, but her eyes were curious as well. That's why I want to try it here, Kat explained. That way after we all have a little, we can leave the rest for them. Unless it's really good, of course. Oh, brother. Ryu sighed, but got the rest of the fruit out and tossed one to Sten, who quickly sliced it. All right, fine, but only one bite. Like Nina said, we should leave the rest for the Yuburupa, even if that guy didn't seem to be holding any grudges. Here you go, folks. Sten passed six of the seven slices out to the others, the fruit was soft and wet inside, and there was a glowing green seed at the core that they ignored. Bon appetite, or whatever. Bon appetit, Monsieur Sten, Jean corrected him, grimacing slightly. Whatever, the Highlander shrugged as they all took a bite. A moment passed, and then they all spat in unison, making disgusted noises. Despite its delicious smell, the fruit tasted more like Ryu imagined the oil he used to polish his armor wood, and once bitten into, it had the consistency of wet leaves. Even Jean was revolted. Okay, you know what? Ryu said after he had recovered his breath. I'm sure the Yuburupa like this fruit very much, so I say they can have them. Setting the rest of the fruit down on the floor, he shook his head. Well, our curiosity's definitely satisfied, so let's get back to business. I don't know about the rest of you, but I think I'll skip lunch. The others mumbled and grunted in agreement. Me and my big mouth, Kat muttered under her breath as they walked back towards the front of the cave, the warp spell only worked under the open sky. Once they were outside, Jean cast it once more, and took them back to the Isle of Tunlin, just outside the circus tent. It was a beautiful night, and the moon was high. Everybody blinked. Did we fall into some kind of time warp or something? Kat asked after a moment. I gotta admit, I didn't see this problem coming. We forgot to take time zones into account, Nina murmured. If it's early afternoon in Oria, it would be a few hours before dawn in Tunlin. Hey. Kat's eyes crossed. I'll explain it to you later, Bao told her. What do we do, buddy? Barge on in there anyways, or what? No, let's give it a few hours. Ryu shrugged. Those of you with magic can take a quick nap and recharge it. That would be appreciated, Rand admitted. Especially if we're going to be fighting a demon after. Go ahead and get some sleep, then. Kat nodded. Me and Ryu will keep the watch. They started a fire, and the others dozed off around it, leaving the two of them to look out for monsters. For once, neither of them spoke much, even once they were alone. They simply sat by the fireside on a convenient log, and when Kat put an arm around him and leaned her head against his shoulder, he didn't mind at all. No monsters came, and eventually, he actually dozed off for a moment. Power We need more of your power. God needs more of your power. Give yourself to God. Pray to God. Praise God. Sacrifice your bodies and souls to God. You are destined to become God's power. Hey, wake up. Cat elbowed him in the ribs. Sounds like the carnies are starting to stir. I wasn't sleeping, Ryu said quickly, opening his eyes. Sure you weren't. She winked. Come on, let's get the rest up. The others awakened quickly for once, and after a quick spot check on their weapons and armor, they began walking over to the tent. 
You know, we could save ourselves a lot of trouble if I just crept in there and took care of business before they wake up, Sten suggested, testing the point of his knife on the pad of one long finger. Tempting, Ryu said dryly. But at least one of them is a decent guy. Maybe some of the others are too. Besides, it's too risky. Even if you didn't get caught, there's a good chance cutting Tusk's throat would just piss him off. Thought that was the plan anyways. Bao joked. Yeah, but only with the rest of us in there with him, Rand chimed in. I mean, if Sten wants to go solo with the guy. Tempting, Sten echoed Ryu sarcastically. But I'll pass. Thought so. Ryu chuckled, then raised his voice. Hello, the tent. Anybody in there? Wakey wakey, rise and shine. Daylight's burning, and time is money. We got business. A long time passed before a groggy carny shoved the flap open and glared at them. You assholes got any idea what time it is? He growled. Where's Bob? And the big rat? Ran into some technical difficulties, Ryu explained. That's what we're back to talk to your boss about. He awake yet? Getting there, thanks to you. The goon scowled. He ain't gonna be in the best of moods. Thanks for the advice. Ryu moved to walk past him, but stopped as the carney held out a hand. What? You know the deal, the man said smugly. One hundred zenny each. Are you kidding me? Kat started to yell, then closed her mouth, growling, as Rand put a hand on her arm. We'll talk to Tusk about that, too, Ryu muttered grumpily, and they all paid up, grumbling. Smirking, the carney ushered them into a tent, and led them back to where the grass man was caged once more, before raising his voice. Hey, Watts. They're back to see Tusk again. So I see, the old man murmured, raising his head from the small fire he was sitting next to, a tin coffee pot was hanging over it. I'll take it from here. He should be along momentarily. You can go back to sleep now. Yeah, whatever. The carney walked off, muttering. Sit, young ones, Watts invited them, producing several mugs from a bag. And have some coffee, while we wait for my glorious leader to arrive. He glanced at Ryu and Bao. We're a long way from Oria, after all. It must have been quite the trip. You could say that, Bao agreed, nodding at the others and taking a cup, allowing Watts to pour him some coffee. I was wondering if you had recognized us. Been a while since then, after all. More than three months, probably closer to four. You could say, I have a good memory for faces, Watts murmured, pouring more coffee for the others as they all sat down and took mugs. I didn't really peg you for mercenaries back then, though. Just because we work freelance doesn't mean we don't try to run a clean operation, Ryu explained, sipping his coffee. You seem like a decent guy, so I'll fess up. We were trying to turn up the sleaze on purpose the last time we talked to your boss. I thought it might have been something like that. Watts smiled for a moment before growing somber. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for my own co-workers. This place has turned savage over the last year, as our star attraction can testify. He glanced over at the grass man's cage, which had a curtain over it, and shook his head. I've done everything I could to make the poor fellow more comfortable, but I'm the only one left here who cares at all. They all treat me like I'm a senile old duffer because of it, but I've been with the show too long for them to kick me out. You're a good man, Rand told him quietly. A rare thing, these days. Not good enough to risk my life freeing him, though, Watts admitted. I pray your deal with the ringmaster goes well, and I can put all this behind me. Helping the poor lads the only reason I've stayed around this long at all, my riddling act doesn't really mesh with the rest of the show these days. Besides, I'm getting too old for all of this. Time for me to find somewhere I can settle down, I think. The group all exchanged a long glance. You've been an entertainer all your life, then, I take it? Nina asked cautiously. Born and bred, young lady, Watts assured her with a wink. Riddles, stories, jokes and more. I was part of this entourage back when we were just a dozen lads in wagons charming small villages into putting us up for the night. Hey. Ryu raised an eyebrow. Listen, how would you? All right, all right, what's going on here? MC Tusk demanded, stalking in. The ringmaster was wearing ridiculous blue silk pajamas with gold trim, but his hair and mustache were as immaculate as ever. Where is Bob, and where's my Yuparupa? Or are you going to pay me the zinni, after all? The group exchanged another, different glance. 
You might want to step back, Sten advised Watts, who nodded quickly and retreated behind the grass man's cage. It's like this, see? Ryu explained to the angry ringmaster, smiling slowly. Bobby boy had a bit of an accident with that Yuparupa you sent us after. Turns out the damn thing was a lot more dangerous than he anticipated. We tried to help him, of course, but by the time we got it off of him. He shrugged. Too little too late. Oh well, no use in crying over spilled ale, right? Looks like you've got plenty more where he came from. Ridiculous. Tusk snapped. Bob was well aware of. He trailed off, dark eyes narrowing. Well, that's beside the point. What of the Yuparupa, then? You did catch it, at least. Without Miss here, Bob. Jean spread his hands innocently. We could not bring the creature here without the hold spell he alone knew, yes. Are you telling me you came back here to get me to give you another one of my men to tag along? Tusk growled. Actually, not at all. Ryu shook his head. See, we've been talking it over and we've decided to bow out of this one. Sorry to waste your time, more sorry you wasted ours. You what? Tusk roared, as Watts poked his head around the edge of the card to stare at them. But the grass man... Can go to hell, same as you. Cat sneered at him. Sucks to be the flower boy, but we're not putting our asses on the line for him against something like that. We saw what that thing did to Bob. Forget it, Tusko. You can't do this. Tusk growled, clenching his fists and actually shaking with rage. This isn't how it works. Don't lie to me, you fools. How many times do we have to tell you? Ryu said sarcastically. We'll give you nothing. Deal with it, already. Are you some kind of idiot, or what? Enough. Tusk bellowed as rows of actual tusks, three on each side, ripped out of his cheeks. If you think you're so funny, then I'll just kill you too. Yes. That should make things much more simple. Time to die. What they, Watts yelped. Told you to stay back. Sten reminded him as M.C. Tusk swelled, expanding further. I'll kill you all. The ringmaster shouted redundantly. His demonic form was a huge, rotund, humanoid mammoth with leathery blue flesh and a thick coat of shaggy white fur. Six tusks lined the sides of his long trunk of a nose, under tiny red eyes, and his massive fists were held at the ready in a surprisingly professional stance. This will be the show of a death time. That doesn't even make any sense. Ryu yelled, transforming into a flame whelp and blasting the demon with a massive fireball. Hit right in the chest, MC Tusk's fur burst into flame, and he began beating at himself frantically. Changing back, Ryu slumped forward, then straightened up, glaring. That won't do it alone. Let's go. Right. Cat growled, charging. Come here, big guy. Ryu ran alongside her, with Rand behind the two of them, while Jean and Sten circled around to the sides, knives and rapier held at the ready. Indeed. MC Tusk shook himself like a dog, and the flames actually flew off, leaving him scorched and charred but still clearly alive. Taking up his stance again, he watched them approach fearlessly, his trunk making a strange, continual noise almost like music. My name's MC Tusk, and I rule this house. I fear none alive, neither man nor mouse. When I call the curtain, your lives are my due. So get yourselves ready, cause I'm gonna slap you. What the hell is he? Sten started to say, then grunted in pain, as did the other four. In a blur of motion, Tusk moved like lightning, his massive fists lashing out to smash them. In less than a second, his flurry of jabs impacted with all of them, knocking Cat and Sten out of the air and slamming the other three away with more force than a falling rock. Yeah. The demon raised his fists in the air triumphantly as they all went down, trumpeting, then snatched Bo's crossbow bolt out of the air. Nice try, but I never die. Shit, Bao muttered. This could get ugly. How the hell does a guy that big move that fast, anyways? Ask August, Rand grunted, sitting back up. He was just as bad. I think it's safe to say that getting in close is a bad idea. What I'm wondering is what's up with that weird singing, or whatever the hell he's doing, Ryu muttered, getting back to his feet. I mean, it's pretty obvious at this point that demons are all insane, but this guy takes the cake. If getting physical doesn't work, we'll use magic. Nina suggested, ignoring that. His fur seems flammable. Sten, with me. Right. The Highlander put his hands together. 
Might as well give it a shot. The two of them focused, and pyramids of flame erupted on either side of MC. Tusk, blasting him with enough fire to light up an entire house in one go. Ha ha. I did it. Magic's the way to go, all right. Bao tried another shot, but once again, MC Tusk batted the bolt aside. Damn. You think you're hot stuff, the baddest of bad? The demon bellowed, trunk making the strange noise again. But if you keep it up, I'm gonna get mad. Shaking the flames off just like before, he clenched both of his fists, and the ground beneath their feet began shaking, slamming them around the tent like they were caught in a landslide, every time they bounced off the ground was like hitting a wall at a full run. Earth magic! Nina yelped, she had looked like she would be unaffected for a moment, flying above the ground, but then Rand had smacked into her and she had fallen to the dirt. He's more talented than he looks. Ooh. No kidding, Rand grunted as the quake subsided and he and Bao cast healing magic over the group. We're dishing it out pretty good, but so is he. This one's gonna come down to whoever can take less punishment. Sorry to spoil it, but that'll be me. MC Tusk bragged. I'm a demon who wins, constantly. You gotta be rough, you gotta be tough, and I gotta say kids, you just ain't got enough. He raised his fists in the air again. Yeah. This can no longer be tolerated. Jean, of all people, snarled as he charged again, eyes flat with a cold anger. Your entire existence is an insult to the entire field of poetry. As a true artist, I shall slay you forthwith, and purge the world of your blasphemy. Suits me. MC Tusk boomed. We'll see. He took up a stance and began jabbing with one stance as Jean deflected his punches with his rapier. For a few seconds, it looked like the Creeper Prince would actually be able to hold his own, until the demon caught him right on the jaw with an uppercut that lifted him off the floor. As he flew, an odd, blue haze of magic rose from his body, dissipating a moment later with a female-sounding groan. Oh! Ryu and Bao winced. Knew it, Sten and Rand muttered, then paused, looking around for Cat. Yaha! The Warren yelled triumphantly, rising up from behind MC Tusk's head as Jean fell. Before the big demon could turn, she brought her bronze battle staff down on his head with an audible crack, and he reeled. Get him. Now. Right. Ryu charged again, and brought his sword slashing out, not at the demon's torso or arms, but at one of his tree trunk feet. Seeing this, Kat realized his plan immediately, and as she dropped back to the ground, she brought her battle staff around again, jabbing the same foot with the tri-pointed edge of it. A crossbow bolt slammed into it a moment later, followed by a thrown knife, and with a bellow of rage, M.C. Tusk toppled, falling over onto his side. You think that you've won? He raged as they closed in on him, raising his fists. I've got white magic, too. I'll recover my health, and then I'll... He cut off, falling suddenly silent, as a magical sigil appeared in the air above him, the same as when Jean had cast the hush spell on the stone doll. Good work, Jean, Ryu said with a smirk, then blinked as he saw the prince, lying completely unconscious on the floor. Hey. He glanced around at the other mages, who all shrugged, then suddenly realized what had happened as he glanced at the grass man's cart and saw one delicate hand of petals pointing at MC. Tusk. Chuckling, he glared down at the fallen demon. Nina, Sten. If you would care to finish this. Gladly, Nina murmured, and Sten grunted his own assent. Casting their spells of flame a second time, they poured fiery wrath onto the helpless demon, and he wailed in agony. No way. No way. I don't want to die. MC. Tusk yelled as the magic fire became infernal black flames, the same ones that consumed all demons when their time had come. But if that's the ticket, I'm not gonna cry. So you would better not laugh cause it's my last stand. It's too late for you, too. God's time is at hand. He trumpeted one last time and raised his fists, already blazing bones, then collapsed into a skeletal pile of ash. Yeah. Weirdest death curse ever, Sten said after a long moment. What the hell? A voice from the back of the tent said slowly, and the group turned to see the rest of the carnies lining up against the curtain separating the area from the rest of the tent, backs pressed against it and eyes wide. Boss. Here we go. Bow sighed. Figures, Rand agreed. No, wait. Ryu held up a hand, and Kat and Nina both nodded. Think we've seen this before. He turned his gaze to the carnies, and they all shrank further back. As you saw, your late boss ended up selling his soul and became a demon. Not a good career move under any circumstances. 
Now this is just advice, but if I was you boys, I'd give some serious thought towards my own moral compass, and consider adjusting it just a tad before you end up like him. We'll clean up our act, sir. One burly stooge promised. We swear it. Honest. He glanced around, and the others all nodded frantically. We'll, uh, we'll leave you alone with the veg. I mean, the grass man now. There's a flap in the back you can let yourselves out of. Old man Watts knows where it is. Uh, see you. They slipped back through the curtain as quickly as they could while still maintaining some semblance of dignity. Does that count as our good deed for the day? Cat asked. Sure, why not? Ren shrugged, rousing Jean with the renew spell. Come on, Jean. We took him down. Ah, but of course. Jean replied cheerfully, rubbing his head, his scales had reverted to their original coloration. There was never any doubt as to our eventual triumph, no. He paused. Something is amiss. I can no longer hear Mademoiselle Sissot's voice. It seems that unconsciousness breaks the fusion, Nina guessed. Hopefully, she'll just be back in her house. You should be able to fuse again once we return. Who are you guys? Watts whispered, stepping back around the cage, face pale. Like I told Tusk, we're just a bunch of old-fashioned adventurers, Ryu explained with a smile. We're the dragon kin. And demon slaying is something of a bad habit of ours by now. He glanced at the cage. Not that we don't appreciate the assistance. Thanks. It seemed appropriate, the grass man said, opening the door in the side of the cage that Watts had used to feed and water it, and stepping out calmly. I'm sure you would have triumphed even if he had gotten the spell off, but it saved you some unnecessary time and pain, and I prefer to be efficient about such things. Everybody blinked. Um, Bao eventually said. Does this mean? You could have gotten away any time you wanted to. Are you screwing with us? Rand asked slowly. Yeah, what are you trying to pull? Kat demanded. Are you stupid or something? Why did you stay a prisoner? You could have been killed. Nina agreed. Ah, you must have had a good reason for not running away. Jean suggested brightly. Seems that way. Sten nodded. So, Mr. Grassman, why didn't you leave the cage? I was advised to wait here for some people who would eventually come to rescue me from this place, the Grassman explained. A group of adventurers, led by a young man with blue hair and green eyes. By who? Ryu asked quietly, the others suddenly falling silent. A strange old man, the Grassman replied. Now that he could see it more clearly, Ryu realized that what he had taken for a leafy green torso was in fact the odd being's clothing, a robe-like garment with shoulders made of petals, as were the feet of its boots. At least, he thought so, it was still entirely possible they were all grown from its body. Its arms and legs were slender and pale, and its face delicate and pretty in an androgynous way, with golden eyes and a pink bud instead of hair, like an unbloomed rose. He came to the circus to speak with Tusk, and then with me in private later on. And he told you we'd be coming to save you. Ryu repeated, glancing around. Nobody else looked amused or happy anymore, even Jean was frowning slightly. Don't suppose there's anything else he said. He said that when I met you, he would like me to bring you to him, the grass man continued. That he lived in a cavern directly above the Sima Falls. More importantly, he said that you, too, would be aware of the presence of demons in this world, and that if I wished to undo their corruption, you would be the ones to ask for assistance. I know of this place, Jean murmured. There is said to be a strange hermit who lives there, yes, although I have never met him myself. Then I think we'll be taking this stranger up on that request, Ryu decided grimly. I want to have a long talk with this guy, all right. He kept his eyes on the grass man as he continued. So, you knew about the demons? Did Tusk let it slip? Not at all. The grass man gestured at a small potted tree in the corner of the tent. Even in my captivity, this tree kept me up to date on events in the world outside, including the plague befalling the land known as Gate. I take it that is why you sought my aid. You need me to help you find out exactly why that happened. Correct. Everybody blinked again. Uh, yeah, Bao agreed. This might be kind of a stupid question, but how did that tree know about all this? It's it's a tree. It doesn't get up and go down to the pub for a few rounds after it gets off work to hear the latest gossip. 
The breath of nature, the grass man explained, walking over and touching one branch of the tree fondly. Through it, I can commune with plants, and they with each other. The stronger the plant, the greater the communion. This tree linked my mind with another, close by here, and then another, all the way to the land called Gate. It closed its eyes. A terrible thing has befallen all that lives in that part of the world. So you know why it's happening? Cat asked excitedly. Unfortunately, I do not, the grass man said quietly. The breath of nature has its limits, and the plague in Gate is not a natural thing. It is the work of another demon, one so great and terrible that M.C. Tusk would tremble in his presence. His power looms over Gate like a fog, and I cannot penetrate it to learn more. Yeah. Ryu somehow kept his voice calm. Yeah, we know the guy. I suppose we should have known it wouldn't be that easy, Nina murmured. There's a wise tree near Gate, though, is there not? If we took you there, would you be able to learn more from it? Perhaps, the grass man agreed. However, if you don't mind my advice, I would suggest instead that we consult another of the wise trees. The one in the place known as Gate. Its face took on a wry expression. It may be inappropriate for me to say this of my elder, but it is somewhat foolish, for a being known as a wise tree, as well as prideful and vain. I've never liked it much. Is it rude of me to say that? No, no, it's fine, Sten assured him, as they all relaxed slightly, that admission had somehow made the alien grass man seem a little more like a person. Trust me, we get what you're saying. We know people like that, too. You're the expert, here, if you think we'd be better off asking this other guy, you would know better than we would. Who is it, anyways? Its name is Genderuf, the grass man explained. And it is the great wise tree. What you would call the leader of my clan. It is the eldest, and wisest, of us that lives. It is in the center of the place called the Sea of Trees, south of the place called Saima. North of Fog Valley. Ren snapped his fingers. I know that place. He grimaced. It's gonna be tough to get through, though. It's the world's biggest forest. Shame we don't have somebody from the forest clan helping us out, Kat suggested, then paused. Oh, shit. Sorry, Bao. I wasn't thinking. It's cool. Bao forced a chuckle, his mixed heritage meant he hadn't inherited the breath of either of his parents' clans. I don't even think about it, myself. I'll be able to guide you, the grass man assured them. I might not be able to walk through trees like those with the breath of wood, but navigating through a deep forest is easy when the trees themselves will point the way. Guess it would, wouldn't it? Bao shook his head, as if ridding himself of the downcast mood by force, and grinned. Pretty cool. Is it? The grass man blinked, surprised. Cool, I mean. Of course it is. Sten chuckled. So you don't mind helping us out? It seems to be the most logical course of action, the grass man replied calmly. You wish to end the plague in gate. I have the same goal in mind. Thus, an alliance with that in mind would be appropriate, would it not? It smiled slightly. I suppose I am lucky in that regard. Had you no interest in solving the problem, I would have had to hire you, and my kind have little knowledge of or use for what you call money, so that would have been difficult. A little, Ryu agreed. As it stands, though, it looks like we've got ourselves a deal. He stuck out his hand, and after a moment, the grass man took it. Ryu Battison. You, uh. You have a name, right? I do, yes. The grass man hesitated then, glancing away, before continuing. My given name is Gus. Gus Aspara. I must admit, you do not look like a Gus, Jean said after a moment. The others all nodded in agreement. I agree. The grass man coughed. I prefer Spar. Spar it is. Bao nodded, then frowned. There's something I have to know, myself, though. Look, I, uh. I don't know how to say this, but. Are you a guy or a girl? I was kind of wondering, Kat admitted. Neither. Spar shook its head. My clan do not have genders, we reproduce asexually. I am neither male nor female. Everybody considered that for a moment. So. What do we call you? Rand asked eventually. I mean, like. Do we use he or she when we're talking about you? Gender specific pronouns. Spar made a disgusted sound. Really, they're so inconvenient. 
I suppose it would be the best answer. You want us to call you in it? Ryu raised an eyebrow. Doesn't that seem a little... I don't know. Insulting. Not nearly as much as an inaccuracy would be, Spar replied. Which would you consider more insulting, young man? Somebody who continually referred to you as it, or as she? Point made. Ryu made a face. Well, we'd better get going, then. I don't think anybody's going to report us for killing Tusk or anything, but it'd still probably be a good idea to move out. Indeed. Spark glanced over at Watts, who had stayed towards the back of the tent, keeping out of the conversation. The old man had recovered from his shock, and was now watching their conversation with more curiosity than anything. I owe you my thanks, Watts. You were a good friend, and did what you could to help me in my captivity. Just cause it was legal, doesn't mean it was right, what they were doing to you, the old man replied, shaking his head. Even if it looks like you were just waiting for these guys anyways. You're an okay guy, Spar. Good luck. That reminds me. Ryu snapped his fingers. You said you were looking for a place to retire. What would you say if we told you there was some new city starting up over in Oria, west of Mount Fuby, and that they had some houses they were offering to new citizens to persuade people to move in and populate the place? I'd ask what the catch was, Sonny, Watts said keenly. Smart man. Bao chuckled. Catch is, it's our city, and we operate out of there. It's not exactly going to be a law and order kind of place, either. But the folks back there are all good guys. Having a retired entertainer around could come in handy. Guess I can stop by and take a look, Watts agreed, heading towards the rest of the tent. I'll just go grab my stuff, then. West of Mount Fuby, you said. I will be glad to warp you there, Monsieur Watts, Jean offered. And then I shall be back in a flash, yes. And then we'll head over to the Sea of Trees, after we go see this old hermit living in a cave, Ryu said, eyes narrowing. I can already tell that one's going to be a doozy. As Jean had promised, he warped Watts back home, then returned to where they were camping out for the evening, down on the beach. They could have gone into the city and gotten rooms, or simply returned to their home, but for some reason, everybody was in the mood to spend the night down on the beach. Jean had brought drinks back with him, and they roasted some fish over the campfire, after the day they'd had, it was good to relax. The Prince of Sima Ford took out a guitar from his pack and played a few tunes with surprising skill, and they passed the bottles around, watching the stars. Hey, there's a Menero, Bao pointed out after a while, glancing out at the waves. Looks like he's coming this way. The Menero clan, Spar said somberly, he had had his share of wine, but if it had affected him in any way, Ryu couldn't tell the difference. An aquatic species of sentience, evolved from fish. Their defining trait as a clan is their highly avaricious nature, which tends to take the form of great proficiency in the field of commerce. Though they have no actual country of their own, their capital is the undersea city-state of Prima, the largest city in the world with the possible exception of Evre, the heart of the Church of St. Eva. All right, we get the picture, Kat grunted. Yeah, here he comes. No way. She blinked, then grinned and waved. Hey, go bed. What are the odds, hey? What they? The Menero stood up on the beach, glanced over at them, then walked over, smiling as well. You guys again? What are you doing here, hey? They'd met Gobe before, Ryu more than once, he was a traveling salesman who swam across the world marketing his wares to whatever markets would give him the highest prices. Despite the age reflected in the length of his white head fins and the silver tint to his orange scales, he was still energetic and cheerful. We could ask you the same thing, man. Ryu motioned for him to sit down by the fire, and he did so cheerfully, accepting one of the bottles from Jean. We just got finished with a job. Seemed the ringmaster of this traveling circus had made a few enemies. The kind who hold grudges for a long time. We took care of it. Remind me never to refer any of my enemies to you. Gobi shook his head. As for me, got a hot tip that the market in Tunlin was prime for magically enchanted accessories. Diamond earrings, lucky charms, iron bracelets, that sort of thing. I'll spare you the sales pitch, though, since you're sharing your wine with an old man. His eyes glittered. Unless you want to hear it, of course. Group like you could do good to have some of that stuff on hand. Maybe next time. Sten shook his head, smiling. Somehow, I get the feeling that buying from a guy like you is best done sober. No offense. Kid, where I come from that's a compliment. Gobi chuckled. Somehow, I'm not surprised by this. Rand rolled his eyes. 
How do you do business up there, anyways? Don't tell me you speak the language. Nah, but Zenny's universal, Gobi explained. The free market up there runs on it. Don't have to say a word, just put what you've got on the counter and wait for the people to make you an offer. My kind of business. Here's to your profit, then, Kat declared, and the group raised their tin cups to the stars. Right back at ya, kids, Gobi replied cheerfully. Looks like you've got a couple more guys. Expanding the group a bit, hey. I am Jean, and this is Spar, Jean introduced them, with an unusual lack of flamboyance. And any friend of my friends is my friend as well, yes. All we really need now is another black mage, Nina added, smiling slightly. Not that I mind my workload, but it would really be better for the group if we had another one to double what we could do when it comes to elemental violence. If you're willing to put up with splitting the paycheck further, sure. Gobi shrugged. Your call. Zenny's nice, but you have to live long enough to spend it, Sten pointed out. Sometimes a slow buck's better than a quick one. Bite your tongue. Gobi joked, and they all laughed. Yeah, I've been hearing stories about you guys. Saima, right. He shook his head. Nasty stuff. You have no idea, Mon Ami, Jean replied, shaking his head. But the pay was good, and that is what is important, yes. You've got your head on straight, kid. Goba pounded him on the back. Heard a few other things, too. Like something about a new town. It's a long story, Ryu muttered, grimacing. I'll have to hear it another time, then. He stood up, handing the bottle back. It was nice chatting, but I kind of need to get up to Tunlin before it gets any later if I want to find an inn for the night. The way this keeps happening, I'll probably run into you again in another month or two. Try not to get killed before then, hey. Same to you, man. Bao chuckled. Don't go getting any angry mobs running you out of town on a pitchfork. I've been out running those since before you were born, kid. Gobi winked, walking off up the beach. You have met that man before, I take it? Spar asked once he was out of earshot. Couple times. Ryu nodded. He's an okay guy. He seems to be an affable individual, the grass man agreed. However, there is something odd about him. I'm not sure what. I'm glad to see that somebody agrees with me, Nina said wryly. It's some sort of very strange magic, but I don't know either. She glanced at Jean. Is that why you didn't introduce yourself fully, like usual? Ah. Jean blinked. No, 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 no. Monsieur Goba seems a fine fellow, to me. It is just. He frowned thoughtfully. A prince of Sima Fort. If some people learned that such a man was employed in this group, it may cause difficulties, yes? I had considered that perhaps it would be best if I was simply Jean. Was that wrong? No way, man. Sten grinned. You're learning. Pretty slick. I'm with you on Goba, though. He's probably just had an interesting life, like Nero. That does kind of happen on occasion, Ryu agreed, looking pointedly around the circle, and they all laughed, dropping the subject. Jean played a few more songs, and they joked and laughed and talked of minor things, and the issues of tomorrow were forgotten for tonight. All in all, Ryu thought, it didn't get much better than that. If I hit M high hit M high hit M high, 